Now we're going to transition into a discussion of what's called crystal field theory. So crystal field theory explains why our lovely 3D orbitals, which are typically degenerate, uh, are not going to any longer be degenerate. And again, reminder, degenerate means all equal energy orbitals. So let's start with talking about octahedral complexes. So in an octahedral complex, we have a coordination number of six. And if you look, all the adjacent ligands are 90 degrees apart. So, and it turns out they come in on the axes, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, on the z-axis. So, and that's ultimately why our five d orbitals, uh, our five three d orbitals, uh, are no longer going to be degenerate. So, if we take a look at the d orbitals, just a reminder: we've got dxy, dyz, I'm sorry, dxe and dyz. And if you notice, all the orbital electron density lies in between, like in this case, the x and y axes for dxy. So between the x and z axes for dxe, and between the y and z axes for dyz. But the key is all three of these, the majority of the electron density lies all in between the axes, which is where the ligands are not coming in. The ligands are coming in on the axes for octahedral complexes. On the other hand, dz, um, sorry, dx squared minus y squared and dz squared, the majority of their electron density lies right on the axes, so right where the ligands are coming in. And so it turns out, you know, our dxy, dxz, and dyz being in between the axes are going to shift to lower energy, and our dx squared minus y squared and our dz squared lying on the axes when the ligands come in are going to shift to higher energy. And so these five 3D orbitals are going to be degenerate under normal conditions unless ligands are bound. And when ligands come and bind, we're going to shift two different energy levels here. So the three that lie in between the axes on the lower energy level and the two that lie largely on the axes in the higher energy level. And this difference in energy between these two, we sometimes symbolize as delta or sometimes delta Q, that is the crystal field splitting energy, sometimes abbreviated CFSC, sometimes also called crystal field stabilization energy, same diff. So we'll find out later on that it is this splitting right here in energy that often results in the transition metal complexes being very brightly colored and things of this sort. So it turns out when the ligands come in to bind to the central metal ion, forming these octahedral complexes, we can have one of two results, either a very fairly large crystal field splitting energy or a considerably smaller crystal field splitting energy. So it turns out the more tightly the ligands bind, and the ligands themselves play a role in that, so, but also, you know, the, the metal ion itself plays a role as well, you know, Fe3+, plus, the ligands are more attracted to Fe3+, plus than Fe2+, plus, for instance, and things of this sort. Uh, but ligands that will cause a fairly large splitting we'll call strong field ligands, and the resulting complex that forms we'll call a low spin complex, whereas ligands that bind more, much more weakly we'll call weak field ligands, and the resulting complexes will be called high spin complexes. So it turns out all in the gap here. So if we've got d electrons to fill in, let's say, so in both cases, we're going to fill in the first three electrons exactly the same way. So everybody gets one before we start doubling them up. But here's where we're going to see a divergence here with that fourth d electron. So when this gap is large, it turns out it is cheaper energy-wise to pair the electrons up. Now electrons are both negatively charged, putting them in the same orbital is going to cost energy, there's a repulsion between them, we call that pairing energy. So, but when this gap is large, so in a strong field, due to strong field ligands and a low spin complex, it's actually less expensive energy wise to pair them up. So in the high spin complexes, however, though, this gap is much smaller and it's actually less expensive energy wise to just jump it up to the next level here. So with four electrons, we see a difference. With five electrons, we still see a difference in how the electrons are filled in. So with six electrons, we're still going to see a difference in how they're filled in. So now we've finally got to pair one up here. So with seven electrons, we can still see the difference in how the electrons filled in. So, but with eight electrons, you're not going to see the difference. You've got three lower energy orbitals that are full in both cases, so and then two singly paired electrons in the higher energy level. And so once you get to eight electrons, you can't tell the difference between low spin and high spin complex anymore. Same thing if we fill in the ninth electron, so and then the tenth electron, you can't tell the difference. So it turns out if you have somewhere between four and seven d electrons, you can tell the difference between low spin and high spin complexes. So if we take a look at the tetrahedral complexes, so in a tetrahedral complex, the four ligands don't come in on the axes, but actually come in in between the axes. And so dxy, dxz, and dyz that are in between the axes are now the ones that shift to higher energy. 
So whereas dx squared minus y squared and dz squared, which are on the axes, now shift to lower energy. So it's the exact opposite splitting pattern we saw for the octahedral complexes. Now it turns out that this crystal field splitting energy, so again delta or delta q, uh, is always considerably smaller than the corresponding octahedral complex. It's, it turns out, you don't have to know this, but it's four ninths of the value is what it would be in an octahedral complex. But being less than half of the octahedral complexes, these are always high spin. There's no exceptions here, just always high spin for your tetrahedral complexes. So if you're filling in the electrons, so it would fill in just the same as if it was degenerate. So everybody's gonna get one with a small gap here before ever starting to double them up. Finally, we'll take a look at the square planar complexes. So most complexes that have a coordination number of four end up being tetrahedral rather than square planar. Um, but when you have 8D electrons, there's a chance you might end up square planar instead of tetrahedral. Not all uh, central metal ions, when they have 8D electrons, end up being square planar. Um, but this is the only time you, where you really typically have that chance. And if we fill in those 8D electrons, the only number we have to worry about. So it always fills in this way. And whether we filled it in the low spin way or the high spin way, this is how it fills in. Um, that top orbital is always going to be empty in your square planar complexes and we'll find out that's the d orbital used in the DSP2 hybridization for square planar complexes.